Hello, uh, I'm Mike Vinsel, and we're reading the illustri illustrated story of Stephen Stroh by me, and this is chapter three. Okay, here we go. So chapter three, Poison Ivy. No bees stung Stephen on his first night moving beehives, but the outdoor crew moved beehives every night for two weeks. Stephen got stung at least once every night after that. One night, he was stung 15 times. That night, when Anton handed him a can of beer at the packing house, Stephen felt himself to be a real member of the crew. He had paid his dues. One night, somehow, a bee had made it, uh, its way inside Stephen's head net. Stephen continued working, carrying the hive as the bee buzzed, in the net, uh, buzzed on the netting, trying to get out. Stephen knew that at any second, that bee would turn around and sting him on the face. Then the bee did just that and stung him on his upper lip. But he had not flinched. In the same order as they had put the hives out, in the second week, they had picked them up. Then one night, the outdoor crew loaded the beehives back onto the beekeeper's big truck. Stephen and Anton stood in the driveway watching the red tail lights of the truck disappear down the hill. Anton explained to Stephen that the beekeeper, beekeeper's name was Buddy McFarland and that he worked the whole East Coast. Now he's heading up to Conway. Then he'll go up to Maine, Anton explained, watching down the darkness of the road. He starts every season in Florida with the orange and grapefruit blooms, then peaches in Georgia, then uh, mainly apples following the spring north, then to here, Anton told Stephen. Stephen detected a hint of admiration for McFarland in Ant Anton's tone. Stephen wondered if Anton sometimes wished he had done something else, something that would have allowed him to see other parts of the country. Over the past 14 nights, Anton had explained to Stephen that Rock Mount Orchards paid McFarland for his pollination services, as did the other farms he stopped at each season. He'd been doing that work long enough that he always went to the same farms every year. He knew the people at each place. Stephen wondered where he stayed for the time he spent at each place. Anton had never mentioned it. Anton had explained that McFarland would collect and sell all the honey his bees had accumulated when he finished for the season up in Maine. There in the driveway, after the rest of the crew had gone inside the packing house and the lights of McFarland's truck had disappeared, Anton told Stephen, I once had a hunting accident. You did? What happened? Stephen asked. My father and I were deer hunting. Just up in the Bullard, I had a 270. I was on push, walking with the muzzle pointed down. You know, you can't keep the safety on if you're on push. Well, I tripped on some branch under the snow, and bam, the thing went off right through my foot. That's why I walked this way, in case you were wondering, Anton said. That must have hurt, Stephen said. Well, anyway, we'd better go inside. Anton said. Pollination was over for that year. The schedule returned to the normal 7 in the morning to 4.30. Stephen returned to the Ford 2000 tractor. His tractor. The next thing to be done at the orchard was to pick up all the branches and sticks from under the trees that had been left in the snow during pruning. A flatbed trailer was attached to the Ford 2000 with six 15-bushel bins uh, lashed to it. Six bins fit neatly on the trailer, with just enough room left over for a little ledge that the people could stand on. The way it worked was one guy would drive the tractor at an idle, as slow as it could go, while the rest of the crew would scramble under the trees, picking up all the pruning scraps they could carry. They'd bring them to the bins on the trailer, until the bins were full. Then most of the crew would rest while whoever was driving the tractor would drive to the edge of the block with a couple of guys riding on the trailer 
to where they would add this season's wood to the mass that had accumulated over the years. In some of the blocks, the mountain of pruning scraps had grown to be a massive woodpile about 12 feet high and a and 100 feet long. Anton said that apple wood was good firewood, and, of course, Stephen was welcome to scavenge firewood any time. Some of the pieces were big, especially in, the older, in older blocks where chainsaw cuts on big branches were part of the pruning. He told Stephen that in the fall, after the harvest, but before pruning started, they would burn some of the wood piles. He said that was a fun time. After there's a little snow on the ground, we get a burning permit to burn the wood piles. It's an all-day bonfire. Not much actual work to do, but you can't leave it alone either. So we get beer and roast hot dogs, Stephen said. I mean, Anton said, grinning. Stephen looked, for, looked forward to that. One of the hazards of spring brush pickup was poison ivy. Poison ivy grew all around the orchards. Underneath the apple trees, it was, uh, for the most part, kept in check by repeated applica applications of 2,4-D herbicide. Uh, but on the fringes, it grew luxuriously. Stephen was un unusually allergic to poison ivy. Ever since he was eight or nine years old and had started fishing, a terrible bout of poison ivy became a spring ritual. Over the years, he had learned to identify that plant uh, in all of its many forms at any season, for it can take many forms. Stephen had had bouts of it in every season, even winter. Early in the spring, poison ivy can be humble, leafless sprigs among the grass, masquerading as tiny maple seedlings, colonizing a field. It can be a low and beautiful ground cover in the forest understory. And it can be a and it can be great gnarly vines as thick as fire hoses climbing up to the tops of tall trees along a roadside, secured to the trunks by advent, adventitious roots clinging to the bark like millipede legs, as if the vine were sewed to the tree with a thousand stitches to the yard. Most people who get any reaction from poison ivy get just an irritating rash, but Stephen got severe blistering and swelling that could easily be passed off as second-degree burns. For him, it was not a minor condition at all. He knew he had to be very careful to look out for poison ivy among the sticks in the grass as he scrambled under the trees. But then he quickly realized that it was everywhere. Tiny beige spr sprigs of poison ivy poked up through the grass, tiny wine-red leaves emerging from the nodes, so small, so early in the se their season that nobody else could identify them as poison ivy. Stephen pointed them out to the other outdoor crew members, but they were incredulous. Those are just baby trees, Jesse blurted out. Yo, Steve, it's going to be all right. Just pick up the sticks and don't worry, added George. Everybody thought Stephen was overreacting, but he knew he was right. Stephen realized that he was not going to be able to convince his co-workers. He knew that it was only he who was so sensitive to poison ivy. He realized that if he pressed the issue, he would end up looking like he was trying to find an excuse not to do the tedious work. He resolved that he would <clears throat> so, uh, he resolved that he would do he would work as hard as he could and ignore the danger. He had gloves on. He hoped that they would minimize his exposure, but he knew what to expect. As he carefully pulled the branches from under the trees, avoiding touching anything except with his work gloves, uh, but working as fast as he could, an old memory came to Stephen. When he was ten years old, he had gotten off the school bus and was walking home up, up, Filbert, up Filbert Hill Road with Rob O'Leary. Stephen and Rob were best friends at the time. They often went fishing down at Frank, uh, Franklin's Pond and the Trout Pond together. Rob was a skillful fisherman. His older brothers had guns and went hunting. 
Stephen and Rob tied fishing flies using feathers from ducks and pheasants and fur from deer, squirrels, and rabbits that Rob's brothers had given the boys. Uh, but that particular day, as they walked up the hill, Rob was messing around the, messing around the side of the road along the stone wall. Stephen pointed out that the plants covering the stone wall were po poison ivy. Do you get poison ivy? All those plants there are poison ivy, Stephen said. Rob looked back at Stephen and apparently saw vulnerability in Stephen's face. He picked a sprig of the brilliant green poison ivy leaves, shiny and turgid in their first flush of spring growth, uh, with the leaves at the tip still showing their youthful reddish tinge. Never having gotten poison ivy, and therefore not allergic to it, Rob approached Stephen, holding out the sprig as one might hold a switchblade. As Stephen retreated, Rob's face took on, took on an aspect that Stephen had not before uh, had not seen before in him. Rob raised his chin high, said nothing, and his eyes looked at Stephen's at a downward angle. His lips assumed a coy half smile. His jaw held slightly forward. It suddenly did not look like the face of a friend. Rob seemed to have noticed that the little harmless leaves in his hand were a weapon and could be exploited as such. Stephen cocked his head slightly to the side, much as a dog does when confronting something he doesn't understand. Stephen looked at Rob, not understanding Rob's suddenly threatening behavior. Stephen knew what Rob was going to do. I get poison ivy real bad. Don't touch me with that, I'm telling you, he said, his voice squeaking in fright as he backed away. Stephen knew that Rob, unafraid of poison ivy and unafraid of Stephen, and enjoying his position of advantage, would touch him with the poison ivy. Then, as quick as a punch, he'd done it. Rob crumpled the tuft of poison ivy leaves in Stephen's face. Stephen broke away from the assault, and the two boys stood apart. Rob kept a calm, superior attitude, chiding Stephen for being so ridiculous. It's just a plant. Don't worry about it, you freak. Now let's go home, Rob said. Stephen knew that the damage was done. On the rest of the walk home, Stephen was astonished that Rob had acted as if he believed that he and Stephen would still be friends after this. Stephen realized that there was something about himself that allowed other people to assume superiority over him. Stephen recognized that this had been an important event, and he must not forget it. Rob had been his friend, but had done the opposite of what Stephen had asked. If Stephen had said nothing that day, Rob would not have thought of the poison ivy at all. Stephen's warning had precipitated the attack. There, picking brush at the orchard, Stephen let his thought, uh, thoughts run to other examples. His uh, to other ex examples, his brother Philip loved to drive the family car dangerously fast. Once, when Stephen was with him. Stephen was scared and told Philip to please slow down, and that, and that had brought the opposite reaction. You scared? Watch this, Philip had said, and he floored the gas pedal. Stephen decided that he would acknowledge that in dealing with unpleasant human behavior, he would have to recognize that simply indicating what you'd like to happen will deliver the opposite. Over the next few days, uh, 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 over the next few days after Rob's assault, Stephen's face erupted into a swollen mass of blisters. His eyelids were so swollen that to open his eyes put pressure on the blisters, forcing out clear yellow fluid, uh, clear yellow liquid, and was terribly uncomfortable. His lips, nose, and cheeks were all a mass of large, painful blisters. The discomfort could be minimized by keeping perfectly still. Eating was a torture, so Stephen drank juice through a straw and only ate solid food when he absolutely had to. 
Stephen missed a week of school on that bout, and even that was too soon going back, as it took three or four weeks to completely go away, depending on uh, when you decided to declare it over. Stephen's mother, having heard the story of what Rob had done from Stephen, uh, called Rob herself and told him to get himself over to Stephen's house immediately. Rob came over, and the angry Mrs. Stroh marched Rob up to Stephen's room to see what he had done. Rob was shocked to see how bad off Stephen was and stood silent. Mrs. Stroh worked hard to control her anger and escorted Rob back downstairs and out the door and shouted after him as he walked away, If somebody tells you not to touch them with poison ivy, don't touch them with poison ivy. Back at the orchard, age 19, as he ran from tree to tree, picking up the sticks, Stephen continued his thoughts about Rob O'Leary and realized that there had been other times where Rob had shown clues to his other personality, a sadistic personality that Stephen had not noticed when they were young. Once in the O'Leary's basement, they were playing, and Stephen had stepped on a broken scrap of pegboard in a pile of wood scraps in the corner. Stephen had asked if that was something important. Rob had done the same thing as with the poison ivy leaves. He had sensed vulnerability in Stephen and pressed the advantage, telling Stephen that what he'd broken was indeed very important and could not be replaced. In fact, it was so important, Rob had said, that it was on the level that presidential elections could be swayed by the absence of that piece of pegboard. Stephen had not known what Rob was talking about, but Rob had pressed the issue to the point where Stephen wasn't sure exactly what trouble he was in or how he might get out of it. And he had become very worried and decided that he'd best go home. Stephen could not have known it, but Rob had thought of himself as helping Stephen. Rob O'Leary had indeed noticed something uh, per peculiar about Stephen. He saw that Stephen was very gullible. Rob noticed that he could say just about anything, and Stephen would believe him. He decided he would say outrageous things, so Stephen would learn to be less gullible. Stephen had assumed that because Rob was his friend, Rob would always speak to him just as he, had, as he had always spoken to Rob, but that was not how Rob was. Back at the orchard, George snapped Stephen from his daydream. Yo, Steve, you with us here? Jesse, George, Bud, and Stephen were waiting for Anton and Brock to return with the tractor. Stephen had not been following the conversation. Paging Stephen Stroh, Stephen Stroh, Please pick up a white courtesy telephone, Jesse, Jesse joked. Oh, Stephen answered, startled. Sorry, I kind of spaced out there. Yep, George said. I spaced out all through school from first grade to high school. Didn't wake up till I came here. Funny you say that. That's exactly what I did, too, Stephen said. Same here, agreed Jesse, laughing. <laughs> I guess that's why we all work here. Same with me. I hibernated through school, woke up in Vietnam, saw my shadow. Been hibernating ever since, Bud said. The next morning, Stephen felt the familiar tingling sensation on his lips and knew that was just the beginning. He again spent the day picking the branches and sticks and noticed that in just one day, the leaves had filled out enough on the poison ivy strip twigs that Brock pointed out to the rest of the crew, it seems that Stephen was right. All these little trees in the grass are indeed poison ivy. Three days after exposure, Stephen's face grew blisters and stung intensely. He knew he could probably get workman's comp for it, but he didn't want to do that if he could avoid it. He also realized that sitting around at home with poison ivy is just as bad as working with poison ivy. So he went to work. Over the, next, over the next week, blisters on his nose dripped yellow fluid that congealed in a yellow stalactite that hung off the tip, earning him the nickname Old Yoke Nose. 
uh, given to him by Jesse. But Stephen was afraid to remove the disgusting, disgusting thing because if he did, it would peel off the top layer of skin and the fluid would increase its flow. Over the next few days, there were many jokes about who's got egg on his face now and such like. But Stephen knew there was nothing else to do but to tough it out. He also knew that deep inside, he was earning the respect of the outdoor crew members, and that was important to him. For the remainder of the brush picking season, the outdoor crew made Stephen the designated tractor driver so as to avoid for further poison ivy exposure. After three weeks, all of the orchard blocks had been cleaned out. Stephen's poison ivy had subsided and it was time to move on to the job he'd, been, he'd be doing for the rest of the season until harvest. That would be the mowing machine called the cutter bar. Okay, I'm going to take a break here. Okay, this is the middle of chapter three.